Never underestimate the power of dreams and the influence of the human spirit. We are all the same in this notion. The potential for greatness lives within each of us. Wilma Rudolph said that. And Wilma had big, incredible dreams and an incredible spirit. Born in 1940 in St. Bethlehem, Tennessee, Wilma was born premature, and she struggled with her health early in her life. By age four, she had contracted polio, and the doctor said she would never walk again. But by age 11, she was walking, and that was just the start. At 16, she competed in her first Olympic Games. And just four years later, in 1960, she was declared the fastest woman in the world, becoming the first American woman to win three Olympic gold medals in track and field in a single game. Hello, my name is Katherine Posey. I am the founder of Tech by Superwomen, and I'm the head of Strategic Partnerships and Alliances for the United States Digital Service at the White House. I have been inspired by my conversations with so many of you yesterday and today, and I'm honored to be invited by WeCode to come and talk about lessons I've learned in building a movement and a career, and talk about what I'm up to today. But before I get started, I want to do a quick poll. I would love if you could raise your hands if you aspire to build something of your own someday, whether it be starting a company, building a product, or both. Wow, look at this, the spirit of entrepreneurship. That's incredible. Now, if you will raise your hand, if you find that the activity of networking can sometimes be anxiety-inducing. I think that's all of us, right? So today, I want to talk to you about the importance of dreams how to build towards them, and I want to share with you the lessons I've learned in that journey, and then I want to talk about some practical steps you can take to build yours and make yours real. We're going to, uh, near the end of our time together, do an interactive networking activity that I promise will be fun, and then we'll bring it back and finish out with a Tech Superwomen manifesto. So it all starts with a dream. It is absolutely critical that you have a dream and then have another dream for your community. I've dreamed of building a career and of founding my own company. And I continue to work hard towards those dreams. But my broader dream, my dream for my community is always with me. And for me, inclusion has been a big part of that. When I was eight, I was gonna live in Paris. I was gonna be a fashion designer, and I wanted to make clothes that would be beautiful and flattering on all women. By the time I was 16, I fell in love with the topic of history. And my mom is an educator, and so I decided I was gonna develop an interactive history curriculum that would teach more broadly about the contributions in the American story that everyone has made, and that would be taught in a way that would accommodate more learning styles. And when I was 22, I created an after-school program that blended poetry and film production so that young people could make media that reflected who they are and that fit with their identity. And in 2011, a few years before, I had returned back home to Anchorage, Alaska, where I was born and raised, after completing school. And I found that I was geographically isolated. But thanks to social media, I was increasingly connected to thinkers and thought leaders and people that I admired who had shared my passion for the intersection of tech and culture and how they informed each other. And so it's February of that year, and I'm listening to my favorite song, Superwoman by Alicia Keys. Has anyone heard the song? Love that song. And for some reason, her lyrics just really struck me in that moment. And I realized that what she was saying is that what makes women super is not invincibility. It's resilience. And I could relate to that. And so this hashtag popped into my head, calling all tech superwomen. 
I put together a meetup really quickly in a month's time for the Inter South by Southwest Interactive Festival and brought together a lot of interesting and fascinating women. And from those discussions, I realized that there was more of a need for this conversation to continue. And a movement started to grow. I increasingly was putting together panels for major conferences, traveling and speaking myself, blogging. And then I had a dream. What if I could create my own summit? What if I could create a stage where the conversation on women in tech would not devolve into one of two counterproductive narratives? The first is that it's a gender war, which is counterproductive. And the other is that girls just don't like math and science. Not true, right? And instead, reframe it to talk about innovation. And innovation thrives on and requires diversity. Could we build a platform where that kind of conversation could take place at scale? So I have this dream. I have no idea how to do it. I don't have a blueprint. I just know it's something I want to do. And a couple years later, through networking and being fortunate and blessed to meet some wonderful people and with the support of my younger sister, Patricia Posey, who's here, and the support of my family, Jim Posey, who's also here, was actually able to pull together an amazing team and produce the first ever Tech Super Women Summit. And I have to tell you that when you have a dream, something in your head that you want to do, and you have the opportunity to share it with others and make it real, there's nothing like it. It literally changes what you begin to see as possible for yourself and for your community. And through that summit, the White House came and participated. And then an even greater call, an even greater opportunity to serve my community came. The call to join the United States Digital Service at the White House and help transform the way government is working for the American people. It gave me this unique opportunity to blend my dreams, my dream for my career and my dream for my community together. Service to our nation has always been a part of the tradition in my family. My father, one of my brothers, my uncles, and my cousin all currently or have served in our nation's armed forces. And I admire and respect them for it. And this gave me a unique opportunity to take the skills I've developed in my career and serve my country in a different way. Building a more awesome government for the people by the people today. That is the mission of the United States Digital Service. We are taking on some of the biggest challenges government faces. From helping veterans get access to much needed benefits, to modernizing our immigration process, to helping students get access to information about financial aid. These are just a few of the ways that technology can actually bring real change into our fellow citizens' lives. And this is part of the team that's doing the work. It's an absolutely incredible team. It's hard work, but it's one of the best teams I've had the privilege to be a part of. It is a group of people who care very deeply about having a positive impact on people's lives and who bring excellence to their work every day. So how are we doing this? All over the country, engineers, designers, product managers, user experience experts are raising their hand and coming and joining the movement. They are people who excel at what they do and who desire to have an impact and help people. Once they join, they can either become a part of the United States Digital Service Headquarters team, which is with the White House, or they can join an agency team, such as the Department of Veteran Affairs or the Department of Education. And they work right alongside with hardworking civil servants, many of whom have been in government for years, who deeply care about their constituents. And we partner together to move forward the most important projects for the American people. But we're building something even bigger than just the United States Digital Service. We are contributing to a growing tradition this notion that public service should be the part of everyone's career. As Teddy Roosevelt put it, work hard at work worth doing. 
And service work is critical because it reminds us of who we are and it reminds us of our tie to others. It increases our empathy and it broadens our perspective. We are at a time when our industry, the technology industry, especially software, is disrupting almost every other industry, right? Creating new and exciting ways of solving problems and delivering services. And government is no different. We have an opportunity to use technology to make meaningful, transformational change in how we as a government meet people's needs. But it only works if those of us in the industry raise our hand. So as you're building your career and as you're building out your dream for your life and your dream for your community, it's gonna be challenging. It's gonna be hard. But especially for women in tech, here are some data to illustrate. 56, 63, 18. 56% of women drop out of technical careers mid-career. This is double the attrition rate of their male counterparts. A Harvard Business, study, Harvard Business School study found this research. Digging deeper into why, additional research revealed that 63% of women reported experiencing sexual harassment and that this was one of the contributing factors to them dropping out of their tech career. A startup team with one woman as a founder or more is 18% less likely to get funding than all male teams. This was according to Newsweek research, which dug deeper into why it has to do with how unconscious bias is playing out. Now, this data may point a bleak picture, but it's not the full story, right? But it certainly does highlight the fact that the culture can be unwelcoming in the workforce, and that sometimes the barriers you face will be invisible, and that means they will be harder to navigate. But the good news is that inclusion is a culture too, and one we can create together. How do we create more welcoming spaces for women in tech? It will be up to you and to all of us to make the community better, you have to participate. Just take NASA mathematician and recent Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, Katherine Johnson, for example. By the time she retired, her computations had influenced every major space program from Mercury all the way through to the shuttle. As an African-American woman in a STEM field in the 1950s and 60s, can you imagine the barrier she faced? I would like to invite all of us to watch the story in her own words. It's in four minutes and 30 seconds of pure inspiration, and then we will come back. Man, it's just there. This has always been a part of whatever I was doing. You're either right or you're wrong. Then I like to write it. They tell me I counted everything. Everybody studied at a big table. And after I finished mine, I helped them do theirs. And I was the youngest. I wound up the head of my brother, maybe two grades. I don't remember how many. <laughs> I entered college, I was 15. I was going to be a math teacher because that was it. You could be a nurse or a teacher. He said, you'd make a good research mathematician. I said, oh, what do they do? He said, you'd find out. So he had me take all the courses in the catalog. Sometimes I was the only person in the course. I said, where will I find a job? He said, you look till you find it. it. Took me seven years, but I found it. He said, you're very lucky. 
Langley has a post for black mathematicians. Just opened it up to women. They had a pool of women mathematicians. They just wanted somebody to do all the little stuff while they did the thinking. They were called computers, women computers. I had been there less than a week when this engineer came in and wanted to women computers and Mrs. Vaughn sent me over to the flight branch and we never went back. Today a new moon is in the sky, placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Oh, they felt terrible that here we sat and diversion said a vehicle riding around looking down on you. So we set out to send somebody up there and look down too. They called a group of engineers and have a briefing as to what they were going to have to do. And I asked, could I go? They said, women don't ever go to those. I said, is there a law against it? They said, no, we'll let her go ahead. I wanted to know what it was they were looking for. So I wound up doing what it was they were trying to find out. Commander Alan B. Shepard was to become the first man sent into suborbital flight. The Mercury capsule is right on course. Our office computed for every mission that went out at that time. The height, the speed, and so on. It became a geometry problem. As ignition sequence starts. I felt most proud of the success of the Apollo mission. They were going to the moon. I computed the path that would get you there. You determined where you were on Earth when you started out and where the moon would be at a given time. We told them how fast they would be going and the moon would be there by the time you got there. Beautiful, just beautiful. We were really concerned when they were leaving the moon, going back. He had to do it just as we said. If he missed it by a degree, he doesn't get into orbit. I was looking at the television. I said, boy, I hope he got that right. <laughs> and I was sitting there hoping I'm right, too. <laughs> John Glenn said, tell her. He knew that I was the only woman that worked on it. He said, if she comes up with the same answer that they have, then the computer's right. It took me a day and a half to compute what the computer had given him. Turned out to be the exact numbers that they had. It was my job, and I did my job correctly. And well. Isn't she great? What I love most about Catherine's story is that she had this spirit of inquisitiveness and determination. Imagine if she hadn't insisted on being a part of this new mission that ultimately led to putting a man on the moon. What a loss for advancements in space travel that would have been. And her life story, for me, really illustrates three lessons that I have found are critical when you're building a movement or a career. And that is the importance of visibility, mobility, and networking. This is Catherine getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama just uh, last year. Catherine raised her hand and advocated for the opportunity to be a part of this new mission. She advocated for the chance to be visible, to be in the room. In order to accelerate towards your dreams, especially as women, when research shows us that oftentimes contributions made by women are often overlooked, it is critical that you advocate to get visibility for your work. And there are a number of ways you can do this. You can start a blog. That was one of the first things I did with Tech Super Women Summit. You can volunteer to lead a project. You can lead an initiative within a company. You can go to hackathons, which is another thing that I loved doing, going and participating in hackathons. Confidence, real confidence, comes from competence. 
And the only way you're going to get that is if you stretch yourself, if you put yourself in situations that help you to take more risks and put yourself out there. Mobility is about growth. One of the other things I love about Catherine's story is she talks about her mentor who told her she should consider a field of research. It is absolutely critical. I would say for me, one of the biggest differences for me early in my career was finding a mentor within the organization I started at who believed in me and invested in me. It's so important, especially when you're starting your career, to find companies and organizations that are going to have spaces for you to grow and to find people within companies or outside who are invested in you and they're going to help you with your professional development. And then networking. So I know from our poll, a lot of us share in that anxiety. I would say, though, that networking was the single biggest asset in building the tech superwomen movement and is a huge part of what I do in my job today. And so I want to talk to you about the three different kinds of networking, with the third being the one I recommend the most. So there's relational networking. Most of us develop these skills in the playground, right? This is how you make friends. This is how you connect with people. Then there's transactional networking. So transactional networking is far more straight down to business. I'm looking for these things. Can you help me? Yes, no, moving on, right? But the most valuable networking is intentional networking. And intentional networking is based on remembering that you have intrinsic value for your ideas and goals, regardless of your title or association. When you confidently connect with someone based on what you're about and what you're looking to do, you build more authentic and meaningful connections. So we're going to have a little fun. You're going to look for two people that you don't know, not yet, but two people that you don't know. You're going to go up to them. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to state a mission or a dream for your life or for your community. You're going to share some things you want to connect on. They're going to do the same. You're going to have the remainder of those five minutes to talk and build a connection. And then I will let you know it's time to find the next new person, and you'll do the same activity. So we'll do that three times, and then we'll come back uh, to talk about the importance of going for it, regardless of the barriers. So before we do that, I want to demo this. Do we have any volunteers who want to come up and do the introduction exercise with me? All right, awesome. Come, come on stage. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Catherine Posey. I'm Maddie. Maddie, it's so nice to meet it's you. It's nice to meet you as well. Fanciest meeting here. So my mission, my dream right now is to build a more awesome government for the people, by the people today. But I'm also really passionate about creating a culture of inclusivity and I really want to connect with others who care about civic engagement. How about you? Uh, my short-term goal is to pass my midterm on Wednesday. My long important. <laughs> my long-term goal is to get more youth into code. Uh, I'm trying to get uh, more people, uh, trying to get a curriculum through into our school board uh, to get more youth involved in code in like high school grades. Wow, so you want to get more youth involved into coding. There was a number of people in the room that I should introduce you with when we're done who are actually investing in those very types of programs. I'm sure would love someone who's got that passion and, and incorporate you into their existing program. That's it. You can say whatever you want. Okay. And I'd like to connect to people just like you were saying about. <laughs> yeah, then we should follow up on LinkedIn and just stay in touch. That'd be great. I have a business card, not on me, but I will give it to you after. Awesome. So nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you as well. <laughs> Well done. Let's give Madeline another round of applause. So easy-ish, right? And there's a networking reception that's happening, I believe, after this. So this is great practice. But again, it's really important to do it with someone you don't know. So your time starts now. Get up. Find someone you don't know. We'll just do two rounds. Find someone you don't know and introduce yourself.
What's that? Can I speak to your question? Yes, I'm please. In, like, somehow getting into politics and I'm interested in, in using computer science and politics and trying to like melt the two together. Policy? Yeah. Yeah, let's talk. Sorry if I like interrupted the flow. I thought no, that was really smart. That well. was great. That was really smart. Thank you. So we're kind of like letting this go up here. Okay, got it. I didn't know if it was live. Was well, like... We can hear you just fine. Oh, good. <laughs> that was a very inspirational moment. Great. Yeah. She's an amazing woman. Oh. I never heard of her. Before. Me neither. And I loved what they said about John Wines. Right? Yeah, I never heard of her before either, and until the president gave her that honor, and I was like. I need to know about this woman. She's amazing. <laughs> okay, we're here for you. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so start wrapping it up. You've got about one more minute, and then you need to find someone new to network with. Can you guys hear me? Hello. All right. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Mic's dead. Hello. All right, everyone. It's time to switch. Find a new person that you don't know or don't know that well and do the same exercise, and then we will come back. All right, everyone, just about one more minute. I think we'll just come back. How are we doing on time? 
You have time to do one more? Okay, we have a bonus round. Find one more person you don't know and do the same activity and then we'll come back. So you're on your third and final person starting now. Thirty more seconds. All right. All right. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? All right, guys, ladies, I hope that was helpful. And we're now going to conclude, and then uh, we'll do Q&A. So if you want to make your way back to your seat. I know. It was fantastic hearing the hum of all the conversations taking place. So to bring us back, I'm hoping, as we're nearing the end, that you've been able to spend this time thinking about what your dream is, the dream you want for your life, and the dream you want for your community. And that the story shared today give you a sense of a blueprint that you can take and make work for yourself. And I want to conclude with, and see if I don't need this anymore. Can you guys still hear me? OK, great. I want to conclude with a Tech Superwoman Do It Anyway manifesto. They said it could not be done. An information management system running on the internet. Tim Berners-Lee did it anyway, weaving together a data communications protocol and the World Wide Web was born. Doing the seemingly impossible has always been our way. So, in the face of the sometimes daunting path women in tech will trek from paradoxes to double standards and closed doors, I'm calling on all of us to do it anyway. If you take charge, you will be called bossy, domineering, and pushy. Do it anyway. If you stand up for yourself and for others, you may be harassed and harangued. And though harrowing, I implore you to do it anyway. If you seek to build consensus, 
you may be called indecisive, wavering, and weak. Do it anyway. If you enter the halls of science and technology, you may find you are one of the few or the only one. Enter anyway. If you decide to be an ally and advocate for the changes needed in your community, it may backfire and have resounding repercussions. Advocate anyway. If you wake up and decide you want to build something, you may find the path to getting investments biased against you. Build anyway. The history of technology is the history of pioneers who, in the face of unknowns and at times seemingly impossible probabilities, defied the odds and did it anyway. Remember the wisdom of Grace Hopper. Don't wait for permission. It is your right to do this. You will not do it perfectly, and that's the point. We're not perfect. But you have the right to try, to fail, and to build without meeting any standard or bar any higher than the one that you set for yourself. So go change the world. Go make shift happen. Anyway. Thank you all so much for your time and attention today. I believe we have time for a few questions. So if anyone has questions, please uh, feel free. I think there's two mics there to ask your questions, and I would love to answer them. Awesome. I see someone making their way. Hi, thanks so much for speaking with us. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we see as people are weighing different opportunities and weighing their options is that there's a much bigger financial benefit to entering maybe the tech industry in a, the traditional tech sense rather than entering in the government sector. Um, how do you reconcile the good that you can do in either capacity and what do you make of, um, what would you make of that opportunity if you were in our position, I would say? It's a great question. What's your name? My name is Kim Osenbeck. Kim, nice to meet you. I think this is a great question, and the good news is you do both, right? I mean, that's certainly what's happening at the United States Digital Service, at 18F, at our other sister agencies. I mean, folks are in the private sector, building careers, and then they do a tourist service, right? So we have people who join and do six months. For example, we have people who join and do a year, two years, sometimes four. But at least for our purposes, we think it's better that people do it on a rotational basis for two reasons. One, it helps keep us as an organization fresh and bringing in the newest ideas and practices right coming in. And secondly, I think it's a real opportunity to, it's not just about technology coming into government and changing government, right? Those of us who go into government, as I was saying earlier, this is going to completely transform what you see as possible. And you, when you're thinking about your fellow citizens and solving problems for them, what that does to how you think and see the world and how you come to understand government, I think is really powerful too. And you take that with you, right, back into the private sector. So I would say do both. Hi. Hey, um, my name is Luana. Hi. So um, I was wondering, how do you keep focused on your dreams uh, when you face big failures or like big setbacks? Yeah. That's a very good question. Is it Ilana? Ulana. Yeah. Nice to meet Ulana. There's this weird, almost like cult following around the word failure in Silicon Valley, right? So it's like fail, fail fast, iterate. Um, but I think we think about it in the abstract. But when you actually are faced with trying something that may not work, uh, I think that can be hard. The trick is just giving yourself permission to do it and to think about why. You know, why is it worth taking this risk even if I fail? Um, and I think part of that is also a culture component, like especially for women in tech where sometimes you feel you're under additional scrutiny, you may feel less comfortable taking a risk, right? So back to the creating a culture of inclusion, how can we just create our own communities of you know, fellow colleagues and friends and classmates where we encourage each other to share fail stories? 
Um, that was actually one of the coolest things about um, uh, some of the work that's been done in government and even on our team. When we're having our team meetings, we encourage people to share something they tried that didn't work. And that way, people can kind of dissect it and, and become inspired by it. So we try and build that into our culture. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my question was, um, well, I learned a lot today about the consumer product uh, focus uh, face of computer science. Uh, what is it like uh, working with computer science in the government? Like, what's, what sort of projects do you work on? Sure. It's a great question. So. I'm not a computer scientist, let me be very clear. I, I do the strategic partnerships and alliances. But I can tell you about the, the work, what's really cool about it is, you think about consumer facing tech, right? You're looking at your end user. Well, our end user is the American people. And so Mikey Dickerson, who's the uh, administrator for United States Digital Service, did a talk on C-SPAN, covered it um, a few weeks back. And he was talking about the fact that this is not like there's no organization you can compare. There's no, he used to be at Google, for example, but he said there's no company out there that you can compare to government because no company says we're gonna meet every edge case, right? Whereas when the government says everybody's gonna have access to something, there's a law behind it. And you have to figure out how you're gonna serve every edge case, right, in that, in that moment. So it, it gives really unique, big, hard problems, and that's what I think is impacting people who want to make an impact and who like to be challenged. Uh, but it's also very exciting. Uh, Lisa Globter, who's the chief digital officer at the Department of Education, she's a, a computer science engineer turned uh, product lead. She talks about the fact that now, through this process of being in the Department of Ed, she's seeing the patterns of how you solve problems being adopted by folks in the agency and how to solve things that don't have anything to do with tech, which is very exciting, right? So there's a way that these two things are informing each other, and there is some limitations. If you're working on an agency team, you're focusing on a very specific end user case, but in some ways, it's not any different, right? You're thinking about, in this case, American citizens. Maybe they're college students, maybe they're veterans. They go into the field, they do user experience testing, they find out what people need, what are the roadblocks, and then they iterate and build something new. So in some ways it's not different, but who you're solving for is sometimes much broader than a private company that might say, well, this is our niche and we're gonna do this one little piece. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hi, Hi. what do you think um, the most important product um, What's the most important product that you think is needed right now by the American people? Either now or looking into like the next several years, what do you think will be the most important product? Okay, this is gonna sound funny. Honestly, Steve Jobs, I believe, said that the t product he was most proud of was the team that built the iPhone, right? So he thought of his team as a product. I would say it's the team. You know, these people are coming and they're doing a year, two years, four years. It's absolutely critical for this work to sustain, that we keep finding amazing people who are willing to raise their hand and join the movement. Because the challenges are going to constantly change and evolve. What we need is that tradition of public service becoming something that we all share in and uh, participate in. Yes, ma'am. Hi. You made some really interesting points about, um, you know, you might be called bossy, but just go do it anyway. Uh, how do you balance wanting to get involved with everything and needing to prioritize those things because there's only, you know, you have a limited amount of time sure. um, and energy. What's your name? Sorry. I'm Tara. Tara, nice to meet you. Hi. That's a great question and I'm going to start off by giving you an answer my dad would give me. <laughs> he would tell me, he's like, you're Jeffersonian, which means you have a lot of different passions and interests and it's just about picking where you start, but it is by no means defining where you end, right? So. You can have passion for lots of different things and you'll start somewhere and then you'll pivot and you'll go somewhere else and then you'll pivot again. And I think it's critical not to put yourself, your intelligence, the way that you connect dots in a box. Because once you do that, once you think it's a choice of like either instead of both and just in sequence, um, it, can, it can start to feel very limiting when it's not. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess you actually just kind of spoke to this, but um, a lot of the girls I've been talking to today have interest, like intersecting interests in tech and some other field. For me, it's tech and public policy. Um, but I was wondering if you would come into contact with people who are 
doing a combination of tech and some in the other industry they thought had made like really smart career moves essentially like because I feel like there are very set paths in different industries and when you're trying to do like an intersection of two things it can be like less clear sure. how you go about making decisions when there's a less clear you know path to follow so any decision making processes around like mixed industry type things. And what's your name? Gigi. Gigi. Thank you for your question. So when it comes to interdisciplinary is essentially what you're talking about, right? Like in academic terms, like can you create interdisciplinary majors where it's not where you're double majoring, but you're thinking about this intersection of the two. Um, I don't know what the answer is within the academic world, but what I will tell you is the world and how we build careers is rapidly changing. And so I would say it's almost to your advantage to make sure you're always thinking about how things overlap because increasingly the opportunities that are being created are the people who are studying how two things intersect, right? A great example is you know, your interest in, in policy and tech. I mean, Megan Smith, our nation's first female CTO, is absolutely inspiration. She runs a team that's looking at the intersection of tech and policy. So you have a bunch of folks who are very deeply technical, thinking about what should our government policy be around net neutrality, around you know, building a better economy that, that takes into account the future jobs, right? So, and that's new, right? There wasn't even an office, this office until uh, President Obama, the CTO role. And so as you can see, that that's a role that's a hybrid. So increasingly, companies are having to find people who can, you know, maybe they are someone who can hack data and they're gonna work in HR and think about how they can hack data to improve the HR process. But increasingly, the people who are driving the most value, I'd say, to businesses, or people who have some sort of dual purpose or dual skill sets that they're bringing to bear. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Ariba, and I really enjoyed how you talked about visibility and gave us great examples of women of color who've done great stuff with computer science. My question has to do with, again, a comparison of the public and the private sector. I spent some time interning with the public sector, and I found that in comparison to the private sector, there was more nervousness around questions of kind of revamping things, doing them a different way, yes. um, intersecting tech with the way things have been done in the past. Yes. So how do you work with that nervousness or that culture, and how do you kind of fight the bureaucratic mindset of, I don't know, more red tape, more yeah. barriers to in innovation? That's a great question. And I'm sorry, your name? Ariba. Ariba, I just wanted to make sure I had it right. Thank you, Ariba. You've hit on something that, uh, is why I think people are fascinated with United States Digital Service, because it's working. And, and it's not easy, because in government, it can sometimes be risk averse. And uh, Haley Van Dyke, our deputy administrator, just gave a TED talk a couple weeks ago. And she talked about how the way to do that is to make doing the right thing in terms of technically the least risky thing, right? And so the, <laughs> the goal is to shift the culture around the concept that change and iterative processes are okay. And for more on that, I really encourage reading the Fast Company article from June of last year called Inside uh, Obama's Stealth Startup, because it gives you a real inside look it, in a much better way than I can illustrate about the very thing you're identifying that was when we first started a challenge, but how we've been able to shift that, shift that dynamic. Thank you all so much. I really appreciated your questions. I'm so inspired by all of you, and I just want you to know that you've got what it takes, and I can't wait to see what you build um, and the new companies and, and products and services that you develop. So thank you for your time.